Okay. <laughs> All right. Got it. On the virtual Bible study tonight, we want to talk about, uh, well, lots of things, one of them being uh, Halloween. We're going to start out with a little discussion with a special guest on the subject of Halloween. Uh, we'll spend ten, five or ten minutes on that. And then we've got uh, several questions that have been submitted by our listeners that don't have anything at all to do with Halloween, but we're just going to make it our listener smorgasbord tonight. Uh, it's going to be a good discussion. We're looking forward to it, and it's going to get started right now. It's time for this week's edition of the Virtual Bible Study. The Virtual Bible Study is a live, internet-only call-in program dedicated to the honest study and discussion of God's Word. Do you have a question? Bible, or are you simply interested in learning more about the scriptures? If so, we hope you'll stay tuned tonight as we look into the pages of God's Word. The Virtual Bible Study is brought to you this time each week by the College View Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. You can participate in the discussion tonight by calling 931 381 4567 or by emailing your questions or comments from collegeview.com. We hope you'll take out your Bibles and study along with us as we begin an exciting study of God's Word on this edition of the Virtual Bible Study. And we are on the Virtual Bible Study tonight. Welcome you to the Virtual Bible Study for Thursday, October 24th, 2000. And 19. Thank you for joining us on the program tonight. My name is Jacob Gwynn. My father, Greg Gwynn, is here. Hello, Dad. Jacob, great to be with you tonight. And uh, good to be with you. Glad that you're on the other end of the line tonight. Monty's in the controls tonight. A little bumpy there, Monty, but uh, we're getting there. Well, he's we're been in off. trouble. He's been off for a few weeks, and so we're going to have to retrain him to do I, his job. I haven't done the controls in months. <laughs> okay, well, we're glad that you're back tonight. Thanks for helping us, Monty. And we'll look forward to your comments, Monty. We'll look forward to yours on the other end of the line at 877-381-4567. Questions at collegeview.com. And in the chat room with other listeners who are filing in there tonight, uh, we want you to comment uh, in the chat room tonight. We're looking forward to a good discussion. We're going to talk about listener questions tonight on the program. We also want to talk with a special guest. Yeah, we've got Josh McKibben on the line with us. Josh, welcome to the Virtual Bible Study. Hey, guys. Good to be with you. Appreciate you having me on. Josh is the gospel preacher for the Lakeside Congregation in Somerset, Kentucky. And uh, we he, he does a, a, a really good podcast of the sermons and other things that he puts out there in Somerset, Kentucky. Uh Actually, just a little bit of heads up, Josh is going to be our speaker at a special weekend session in January. It's the next special thing we've got scheduled here at College View. And the last weekend of January, Josh is going to be here uh, to preach to us. And so this is a little introduction to our audience uh, about Josh. Josh, Josh tell our listeners about, the, about your podcast. How can they find you? Uh, yeah, uh, the, the church's website is uh, ledbytruth.com, L-E-D-B-Y-T-R-U-T-H.com, and uh, you can get access to, uh, to our podcast through there, and of course, in addition to the weekly uh, sermon podcasts uh, every Sunday. And you can also uh, be we, found on, uh, on, on Apple, Apple Podcasts, yes, so, those, search those, for yes. Led by Truth. That's right. If you search for Led by Truth Podcast, you can find it on Apple Podcast, um, Google Podcast, and all the other major podcasting services. And, and you really do a great uh, job, Josh. Uh, when I get a chance to listen, usually what it, my downtime to listen is when I'm in the car driving someplace. And it's yeah. re it's really great to plug. You know, all these new audio systems on these cars let you play uh, your your. Uh, phone right through the radio and I, I turn on one of your podcasts pretty often and and uh, it's really good you do a great job so that brings us to why you're on the phone tonight josh because in a recent <laughs> yeah. podcast you talked about um well you talked about lust but you talked about a different kind of lust that may be not on the radar screen of a lot of christians today yeah, um, of course, you hear the word lust, and especially if you hear it from our pulpits, you know, we immediately think about uh, physical, sexual lust and the dangers of that in our, you know, hypersexual society. And we talk about the dangers of the lust of the flesh, and we talk about the dangers of pornography and other kinds of sexually explicit content that's out there. But um, th there's this other form of lust that in many ways is just as uh, deadening and dulling to our senses, uh, and is in some ways even just as damaging to our our spiritual well-being, and that's the idea of bloodlust, um, and that's a word that kind of fascinated me, and that's kind of what got the ball rolling with uh, uh, that particular episode of the podcast. So, 
you, when you talk about bloodlust, you're talking about violence and uh, and the appetite for that type of thing. Even uh, shockingly enough, that we'd be entertained by uh, that type of of material. Yeah, I mean, you, you can talk about people that are actually engaged in the, the the bringing about of bloodshed, but I think that that word can also connotate the idea of just the desire to see that, and yes, to be entertained by gratuitous depictions of uh, violence and bloodshed. I, I, um, Josh, I just saw a, a news article. I didn't, obviously didn't see the movie, but I saw a news article that was discussing some new movie, some new Halloween movie that is out that is so gross that it's making people in the theaters sick to their stomachs. Uh, and and people are, uh, I mean, they're, they're sort of advertising it proudly that this is the most violent and graphic movie ever put out. Uh, and people are paying money to go see it. Yeah, and it seems like especially at this time of the year, we, we, we tend to maybe be a little bit more accepting and, and in some respects even glorifying of the sight of uh, blood and gore. And, um, and, and, and sometimes it's even cloaked under the guise of, you know, fun and, and entertainment. Um, but what can start out as, you know, kind of a gory diversion in our minds uh, it can, can lead to just a, 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 just a rottenness of, of the soul. I actually – the whole the whole thought of this came about when I came across some writing by Augustine um, from like the third or fourth century, whenever it was that he lived in his his book Confessions, and he was talking about his his young student Olypius, and Olypius developed this really self destructive infatuation with the gladiatorial games. You know, if you went to the Roman Colosseum, the, the whole idea there was to see blood, was to see, you know, people get, get hurt, get killed, even animals to be, you know, just flayed right in front of uh, human eyes. And Olympias had, had vowed that he would never, never go take part in that, just didn't want to see it at all. But finally, some friends encouraged him to come. But what he decided he was going to do was he was going to close his eyes and try not to imagine what was happening. Well, what Olympias failed to do was to cover his ears, yeah. because when he first started to hear the sounds of the crowd reacting to what uh, they were seeing, it forced him to then open up his eyes, and the curiosity of what he saw ended up uh, spiraling out of control to the point uh, that what was you know, kind of just a, a morbid curiosity at first became something of an obsession with him where he wanted yeah. to just go back again and again and again and bring others with him well he uh, to, yeah and he's not the only one that's ever gone that route uh, our society it, it, it's just not debatable our society has become increasingly more violent and I think a major major contributor is the the violence that that our young people especially are being fed via video games by by movies uh, by television the, the the violent content i mean i grew up in the age of cowboys and indians on tv tv was a pretty new thing back in those days and one of the major cowboys and indians were new back then too. well that cowboys were still fighting the indians when i was a kid <laughs> okay. uh, but back in back in that time i mean so matt dillon on gunsmoke shot a guy but there, there was no blood or gore. I mean, he, he just fell over, you know. But now it's so graphic. And, and I've got to believe that, that that is turning our society more violent. But now, Josh, to the connection about Halloween. What are we doing with our kids uh, uh, in regards to this violence in the Halloween season? Yeah, it's it's really troublesome, and and I, I certainly ought to preface everything that you know that, that I say about this by saying I'm I'm not anti Halloween, and I'm not like a stick in the mud. Yeah. No, I'm not anti candy. <laughs> I'm, for for those that I have friends that are on Facebook, they will notice every Halloween I like to get dressed up and do it with my my little daughter and and my wife. We, we have fun with that. Um, but there is something to, to be said about – stop and think about you know, whenever there's violence on a television show uh, or on a movie that we're watching, and we're kind of quick to react to, to cover our children's eyes. Well, well why are we doing that? Is it, is it just because we think that they're, you know, they're not mature enough to watch that show, or, or is it because we, there's something in us that recognizes that they have an innocence 
that, that needs to be protected. Yeah. Um, and and certainly at Halloween time, you know, you, I mean, walk outside. I mean, you're going to see lots of innocent uh, costumes and lots of innocent fun. And, and I'm I'm all for you know a good scare. You know, the ghost and you know being boo. You know, all of that kind of thing. Um, but but we're just pervaded uh, by you know depictions of of blood and maulers and murderers and monsters that destroy and tear things up and um, th- that 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 eats away at us. It makes us it makes us less human instead of being more human. I think, uh, you're I, right. I think about I think about what the Lord says in Isaiah thirty three and verse fifteen when he's asked about you know who who can stand before the Lord who is the righteous person and he says there it's the one who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from looking on evil so it's not only do I, do I not even want to, to to look upon I don't even want to hear about it yeah um, that, that I'm going to protect my senses to stay away from that and especially with our children uh, there needs to be a greater awareness of that okay so. Again, I think we're on the same page, Josh, as we talked earlier today or yesterday. Uh, I don't personally have a conscience against kids dressing up and going to get candy uh, on on the day we call Halloween. I know there are some Christians who do have a conscience against that, and I would certainly honor their conscience. But I'm not. Uh, that, sure. I, I, I'm not there. I, I I think I can justify the dressing up uh, uh, and and in fun costumes and going and getting candy and that sort of thing. I, I think it's, I think that is innocent. I don't think personally, I don't see any problem with that, but the violence associated with some of this graphic uh, stuff that is for some reason connected with Halloween uh, and, and, but just in the broader sense, what we the violence we expose our kids to in general, we got to be aware of that. Yep. Yeah, Kevin in the chat room says, Josh, is bloodlust what we might see in our graphic video games today? And that certainly goes into it as well, doesn't it, Josh? Yeah, you know, the, 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 the Olypius story, we, we, we may not go to the Roman Colosseum like Olypius did, but, but we certainly have our other Colosseums. We go to the movie theater. That's our Colosseum. We gather around in the living room, around our television and around our video game consoles. And that becomes the Coliseum where we, you know, view, and especially with the games, where I'm getting to actually, you know, play a role in in, in, in this kind of violence and yeah, gore. Yeah, and, and, and the virtual world is, uh, I think sometimes people are having trouble distinguishing between the virtual world and the real world. You remember that, uh, this has probably been 10 or 12 years ago, we interviewed that guy from that, he was some, some national organization on violence in video games, and yeah. he had connected the video games with the school shootings that, 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 that you could, the kids had been playing these games before yeah. they went in and, and massacred everybody. So yeah. it certainly is a problem. Uh, what about movies, Josh? You hear a lot of people who they're going to go watch that rated R movie, and the answer they give as to why that's justified, it's only violence. How would you yeah. answer that? Yeah, that's and, and, and that that that's troubling, especially you know, especially if you talk to a Christian, uh, you're often going to hear things like, "Well, you know, I'm not going to become violent because of watching a violent movie." That doesn't you know, affect I'm, me. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't affect me. I'm not going to go out and murder someone as a result of this. And and perhaps and probably statistically, that probably is correct. You, you most people probably are not going to. But I, I wonder, especially with with talking with a Christian, what would we say to somebody who wanted to justify their viewing habits of say, let's. let's go back to the to the physical sexual lust you know someone who wanted to justify their habits of, of watching pornography or movies that had on-screen nudity in them and they use that same justification oh I'm, I'm I'm not going to go and commit adultery I'm not going to go and be involved in fornication as a result of that well well we wouldn't accept that for one second you know we'd be quick to jump in there and say whoa 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 there's there's, there's more to it than that. It's not just the fact that, you know, you may act upon those impulses and do something uh, physically wrong, but there's still what that's doing to your heart, what that's doing exactly. to your mind. You know, Jesus talks about how all of that stuff, it all emanates in the heart. That's where it all begins, exactly. where it starts. And so I want to be protective of that. I want to guard uh, my heart, as the uh, wise man says in Proverbs. Exactly Absolutely. right, Josh. Well, Josh, thanks for spending a few minutes with us here on the Virtual Bible Study. I think you're making a really great point there, and we appreciate you for bringing that out and, and sort of highlighting that as a an, an issue to be concerned about particularly at this time of the year and especially with our kids. And so I think I think that's a really important point to stress. Thanks for joining us tonight. Appreciate it. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Josh. Me. And that's a Led by Truth podcast on Apple uh, Podcast, whatever podcast receiver you might be using, or your, your website is ledbytruth.com? 
That's right. That's uh, right. And we really recommend you, uh, you yeah, people get on that and listen to that. And we look forward to seeing you down here in Columbia, Tennessee, Lord willing, last weekend in January 2020. And uh, Kevin's in the chat room. He says he's going to add your podcast to his favorites list, Josh. So uh, keep up That's the good That's great. Work Enjoy hearing, hearing folks making use of that. Right. Okay. Th- thanks, thanks, Josh. Josh. Appreciate it, guys. Uh, Bye-bye. discussion and appreciate that tonight. Uh, we're going to get a break, and when we get back, we're going to get into listener questions. What's the first one we're looking at tonight? The first one that we're going to get tonight has to do with separation in marriage. And as several involve questions about, is it okay for husbands and wives to separate from one another? Ah, good question. Got some good answers, so we're going to get to that, and we'll get yours as well. So don't go anywhere. The virtual Bible study continues right after this. Don't touch that mouse. The virtual Bible study will be back right after this. What does your church have for my children? At the College View Church of Christ, we don't have pizza parties or putt-putt nights. We don't have softball or basketball. We do have the Bible. We do have the powerful sayings of the gospel of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We do have the love for your children's souls to never substitute the solid spiritual teaching they need with superficial secular activities. If this is what you want for your children, bring them to Bible class this Sunday at 9.30 a.m. at the College View Church of Christ. Here's some quotes worth pondering. Trust in yourself and you're doomed to disappointment. Trust in money and you may have it taken from you. But trust in God and you are never to be confounded in time or eternity. You can't do much about your ancestors, but you can influence your descendants enormously. If you think of this world as a place intended simply for your happiness, you might find it quite intolerable. But think of it as a place of training and correction, and it's not so bad. Man, wish I'd said that. Share your comment with the world. Call in now and be a part of the virtual Bible study. Now, back to the program. We're back on the program tonight uh, as we talk at listener questions now uh, that listeners have sent in. And that's a reminder for our listeners. Uh, we want to hear from you. If you've got a question, it doesn't even have to be a question necessarily that, that you really want to know the answer to. Maybe you just think it'd be a good question for people to hear discussed. Uh, send us so, a question exactly at collegeview.com. Right. And you 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 got a you got an ac- ongoing pile. I keep a pile of these. Uh, you know, I had a guy who who who, act, uh, who had sent in a question, and then he sent me a, a, a few. Well, I guess it was a few weeks after he'd sent it in. He said, "I guess you didn't like my question." I said, no, "I wrote him back." I said, "No, no, uh, you know, we, we I don't always have time to respond, but I always." save up these questions and so you know uh, don't think that we're ignoring you if we, if we haven't got to yours yet okay so here's the question starting out do the scriptures teach that marital separation is ever acceptable that's the first part of the question okay. and then our questioner suggested the verse that you have got to consider in regards to that is 1 Corinthians chapter 5 now, chapter 7? Uh, excuse, excuse me, chapter 7, verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. But I, w- I want to back up uh, to verse 2. And let me read this. 1 Corinthians 7, beginning verse 2. To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the wife render unto the wife, excuse me, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now, what Paul's, we don't want to be indelicate there, but what Paul's talking about is the responsibilities that husbands and wives have to one another in the, in the intimate sexual way. And, and he says that you should be mindful that you have these duties. And, it, and in fact, it is part of God's plan for, for us to avoid the sin of fornication. Let every man have his own wife. Let every wife have her own husband. And so since that's part of what marriage is about, then don't forsake that responsibility mm-hmm. is what Paul is saying there mm-hmm. very straightforwardly. And he specifically says don't defraud one another. In other words, if, if a husband uh, would not provide consideration to his wife or if a wife wouldn't con- provide consideration to her husband, Paul used a pretty strong word there. He said it would be a defrauding. You'd be cheating your mate in that sense. Um, <laughs> And so he says, don't, don't keep from one another. Don't, don't abstain from this activity. He says, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So that's verse 5. So the first answer I would have to give is, do the scriptures teach marital separation is ever acceptable? 
I'm not sure whether the listener means when he says marital separation, he means, uh, in other words, the wife leaves the house or the husband leaves the house. Living uh, across town. Uh, living across town. I'm, I'm going to get my own apartment. I'm not living with I'm you anymore. I'm up to here. Yeah. yeah, I'm not living with you anymore. Yep. I don't think that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5 is talking about. Uh, 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 so it depends on what you mean by separation. It does suggest that we could abstain from this particular activity for a time. But even at that, he goes on to say, oh, well, Paul says it, it's not going to be for a long time because the purpose of it, Monty, is for prayer and fasting. You know, you would think since it uses the word prayer and fasting, <clears throat> especially the term fasting, we're not going to be fasting for weeks and months. We're not uh -huh. going without food that long. Right. And what we're talking about here is also a natural desire that God placed in us, just like we require food, we require this other attention. And so it, I would think it would, wouldn't be for any longer than we'd be fasting. I mean, if, yeah. if the purpose of it is for prayer, prayer and fasting, uh, mm -hmm. it says by, for a time, it says by agreement or by consent. So if we're doing this uh, depriving each other, it's going to be, we fixed a certain amount of time up front that it's going to be for that, that we're going to, that, oh, for this amount of time, to, we're going to be fasting and, and it's praying. it's going to be a whole lot of long And time. it isn't because you're squabbling either necessarily. No. It, well, it, I, mean, I guess it could be if you're going to But we've come to an agreement to get over we're going to fast in prayer for this yeah. spiritual purpose yeah. and for this limited amount of time, we're not going to be engaging in this activity, but we're planning with uh, also Beth, for this agreed upon time to come back and, together. And again, stress, the text itself proves it couldn't be a, a, a permanent or long-term separation because you're supposed to be fasting while you do it. But and, it, and you, I agree. It's not talking about we're not living in the same house anymore. Yeah. It's we're still together, but we're just not engaging in sexual activity for yeah. this specific yeah. agreed upon time. All right, now Kevin in the chat room says, "Yes, this that is the only passage for separation, very specific requirements in separating." And he says this passage in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 5 does not give any long-term Exactly permission. right. Exactly right, Kevin. Now, now he, uh, he the questioner goes on to ask, "Would both partners need to consent to the separation?" Well, it says so, right? Uh, defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time. So I'm thinking that's mutual consent there. In other words, it's not the husband saying, okay. Well, the, ter the translation I was looking at uh, said by agreement. Oh, yours says so It's that's something that we've American come standard? to an agreement. Yeah, something we've come to an agreement about. It's not I'm doing this whether you like it or not, but we've agreed upon this that it's a good thing. Okay, so what if, and then he says, what if one no longer wanted to be separated well, I'm, I'm getting a hint maybe from this questioning that this was more than just abstaining from intimacy. This was moving out. This was moving out. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm, I'm concerned that the way this question is playing out is he's suggesting moving out, being literally separated, not just, not just abstaining from intimacy, but actually not being in the same proximity anymore. Yeah. yeah. I don't think, I'm like Kevin, I don't think there's any authority here in 1 Corinthians 7 for that sort of thing. Uh, uh, but even if it was just in, in the matter of intimacy, it would have, it's by agreement. And if one doesn't want to do that anymore, then it's over and you're back together. And, and Paul says specifically, uh, come together again so that you will not, so Satan won't tempt you because you've been apart in yep. that, in that way. Yep. So, yeah. I, I, if, if you go on down in this same passage in first Corinthians chapter seven, verse 10, Paul said, but to the married, I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, the wife should not leave her husband. So if this separation they're talking about is a leaving of each other, we're specifically commanded not to do that. Yeah, exactly right. So, yeah, I would think, Monty, you're right that verses 10 and 11 are more the idea of long-term mm -hmm. separation and told not to do it. Okay. Uh, so, so now, keep reading. Uh, more questions here. I, I really appreciate these questions. I think they're important questions to discuss. How, he says, how should the church react if biblical conditions for separation are net, not met by the couple? I got to tell you that I think the kind of thing that 1 Corinthians 7 is t talking about the church would never know about that. I mean, there, yeah. you know, we don't we don't typically talk about our intimate activities, uh, even among church members. We don't. So uh, I, again, I think the separation that that he is asking about would be this long term moving out, living in separate quarters. Well, I think the church is going to be upset about that 
immediately because that's that's a that's a no go. That's a sin. That's, they shouldn't be doing that. We would we, try and encourage them. We, to we would try to get them to repent to be to be restored to a right yeah. relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if it if they refuse that encouragement, we might have to withdraw from them. Yeah. I think that's right. So his question is, how should the church react if biblical conditions for separation? I'm not sure that, again, if the separation is this moving out kind of thing, there are no biblical conditions for that. But, but regardless, if, if this situation is not what it should be, then the church needs to be involved, needs to be seeking to restore these, these people. And if they will not repent, then they, they're going to have to step it up and, and ultimately maybe even church discipline or withdrawing ourselves from such a person. All right. Next question. Now, here's the last part of the question. Oh, no, no, no. We there's still two more. There's two, two, two more. Uh, do emotional issues like he doesn't respect me or I have been abused, does that grant any more authority to a separation than similar emotional arguments made in regards to divorce? My answer to that is absolutely no. Uh, because there's not biblical there's no support for you can't divorce no, even for something as horrible as a physical abuse there's no biblical authority to pursue a divorce for physical abuse now i would take the view that that if a husband's abusing his wife for instance i don't think she has to stay there and take a beating every day i think she can protect herself by by distance distant in, in that sense maybe even establishing a distance between her and her husband so that he can't abuse her. But her goal has to be reconciliation constantly. In other words, I, in other words she's, only, she's only separated herself from that abusive situation for the sake of protecting herself or her children. I think she has the right to do that. But her goal must be she can't say, I'm going to divorce him or I'm going to be permanently separated from him. There's no justification for that. But her goal must be reconciliation as soon as, as, soon as a degree of safety is assured to her um all right and the last one and then the last one do the commands about withdrawing from an erring brother in first corinthians chapter five do those commands authorize a spouse to physically leave their erring christian spouse until he or she repents okay so here's the scenario i'm going to just present a scenario uh here's a woman and her husband is an alcoholic. He's a drunk, and he won't repent. The church has been involved with him about his sin of drunkenness, and he won't repent. And they've stepped it up, and they've moved it on down the line. And, and now they've come to the point where the church has marked this individual and withdrawn themselves from him. He, he's been disciplined by mm -hmm. the church. The wife is still married to that guy. What is she supposed to do? Can she physically leave him now because the church has withdrawn from him, Monty? I don't, I don't believe that she can because we're only given one reason allowable by God in the Bible for physically leaving each other, and that's for the divorce for the cause of fornication. If this alcoholic husband has committed fornication, she can leave him over that and divorce him, go through that process. But short of that, she still has her marital responsibilities, as we were just talking about a minute ago, that have to be fulfilled. It's a command of God that we're for, to fill those responsibilities. And just because he's an alcoholic or whatever other or, excuse she might from use, person. Or, yeah, and a withdrawn from person, she's still got her responsibilities that, responsibilities that have to be met. I think that's right. I, I do not think that would be justification for her to leave. She certainly should be as concerned, more concerned, surely, than anybody else in the church about restoring this fellow, but she doesn't have authority to divorce him or to leave him, uh, physically leave him. She still has her marriage vows and her marriage responsibilities that she must fulfill. Kent is in Calhoun, Georgia. He responded tonight and said, Divorce for fornication is the only authorized reason to scripturally break a marriage. He references Matthew 5.32 and Matthew 19.9, even separation of a husband and a wife is a very serious matter and should never be taken lightly. However, in extreme situations to preserve human life, such as physical abuse, and even as an attempt to prevent death where there can uh, can arise situations where separation, not divorce, may be acceptable, even then 1 Corinthians 7 verse 5 must be considered. Obviously, separation is not justified only on the, the basis of emotion. When a separation is necessary in view of 1 Corinthians 7 verse 5, the goal should be 
the husband and wife being reunited. One problematic area one needs to consider is that legal separation should never be used as a means to lead an unscriptural, uh, lead to an unscriptural or unauthorized divorce. Do the commands about withdrawing from an erring brother, 1 Corinthians 5, authorize a spouse to physically leave their erring Christian spouse if, until he or she repents? No. Even though fellowship has been broken in view of 1 Corinthians 7 and other New Testament passages, that deals with family matters. There are other God-given requirements that must be fulfilled. The same principle would be true regarding an unruly teenager with whom the local church had withdrawn. God-given parental obligations would remain, even though the fellowship could not exist until repentance and restoration would take place. I think that's right. And I think the key to what Kent's saying there, and I agree with him, is that there's, a diff there's another relationship that exists. In other words, so here's this husband and wife. They're brother and sister in Christ— but they're also family. They're also husband and wife. And so the brother and sister in Christ relationship is affected by his unfaithfulness. But the husband and wife relationship has not changed due to his sin. And so she's still obligated in that. Kevin's, Ma, Ma, oh. I think Mike got that. No, I, okay, Kevin go says in the chat room, there is a very simple question to ask of those who may, might be striving for separation or separating. Do you love your husband? Do you love your wife? If the answer is no by either, the next question needs to be, when will you repent of this sin? He references he, Ephesians 3, 5, verse 25, that says, Husbands, love your wife. And Ephesians 5, verse 33, Wives, respect your husband. He says, if somebody's not going to, is wanting to separate, it looks like a lack of love to him, which would be something you think, need to repent of and get that fixed, and uh, then you wouldn't need to separate. I think that's right. Spot on. Spot on, Kevin. All right. Well, well also... On that, uh, when you're taking your vows, you've t taken vows to provide for each other's needs like that and to love and honor, obey, uh, to keep ourselves for each other. You've taken a whole list of vows in the marriage vows, and if you're trying to get out of that because you don't love them anymore, you're, you're saying, I'm not an honest person. You can't trust me to keep my word. Yeah. You're, you're lying. You're, you your haven't vows. kept your commitment, a commitment that God has bound uh, us to and is not releasing us from. That's right. If, if marriage is a lot of things, but one thing is it's a promise. You made a promise. You're yeah. not keeping your promises. All right. Well, let's get a break of this week's bullet point. When we get back, you ask a question I had to Google. Okay, so the next question is was asked by a listener. Are you familiar with a ministry called Celebrate Recovery? What are your thoughts about a congregation participating in such a prog program? And is it wrong to worship with a congregation that is involved in such a program? All right, Celebrate Recovery. Maybe you need to Google it while we're gone. But yeah. We're going to break, and we'll get back right after this. Did you hear what they just said? Call in during this break and let everyone know what you think. The virtual Bible study continues after this announcement. This is Greg Wynn with this week's bullet point. At an assembly of the Presbyterian Church, the delegates approved a compromise policy statement on the subject of abortion. It says, quote, The Presbyterian Church USA does not advocate abortion, but instead acknowledges circumstances in a sinful world that may make abortion the least objectionable of difficult options. Analyze the statement for a moment. It is one of the finest examples of situation ethics mentality that you may ever see. These folks admit that abortion is wrong, but then argue that in some situations there may be no acceptable alternative. In other words, there are simply some instances when a person cannot do right. There are times when you must choose between the lesser of two evils. God's Word denies this concept completely. There's never a justifiable reason to do wrong. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So if you need more proof, consider all the faithful servants of God throughout the centuries of time. Think of Noah, Moses, Elijah, and others who endured difficult and trying times yet remained loyal to God. Early Christians suffered intense persecution but were steadfast in their service to the Lord. The ultimate example is Jesus, who did no sin and left us an example that ye should follow in his steps, 1 Peter 2, 21 and 22. And so the Presbyterians have missed it. But be careful about judging them without first looking at your own life. Christians too often excuse their spiritual neglect by using similar reasoning. For instance, I know I should be more faithful in attendance, but I've been so busy at work. Or I know what I did was wrong, but I just couldn't help it under the circumstances. No, wrong is always wrong. Faithfulness to God requires making right choices, and it is never a matter of choosing the least objectionable option. That's this week's bullet point. Think about it. Hi, my name is Bob Tidwell, and I want to remind you that the Virtual Bible Study provides a great opportunity to use your computer for something good. So turn off the TV and guide your family around the computer each Thursday night for the Virtual Bible Study. 
broadcasting around the world with truths that are out of this world. The Virtual Bible Study. Take it away, guys. We're back on the program tonight, reminding you this program is brought to you by the College of Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. We want you to find out more about us at our website, thevirtualbiblestudy.com or collegeview.com. And that is also where you can find out how to podcast sermons that have been presented here. We just put up, uh, we will put up tonight the last sermon from our meeting last week, Rodney Hampton uh, presented on the Judgment Day. And so if, if you haven't checked out those podcast, that podcast feed, check it out there. And you'll also want to find out how you can uh, view the sermons. If you are at a computer and you can watch or on your television, watch uh, the sermons. You can actually watch them being presented here at, uh, on our YouTube page for the, the church. Check it out at thevirtualbiblestudy.com or collegeview.com. Again, send us an email anytime with your questions or comments. Maybe you listen to something and you think, you know, they missed it on that answer. They missed it on that topic. Send us an email and let us know, or get, send us a question uh, that you'd like to just have discussed in this format. And also send us an email with your snail mail address so you can get a bumper sticker and help us spread the word about the program. Get on our, get on our r- mailing regular list. mailing list yeah. by sending us an email to questions at collegeview dot com questions at collegeview.com and just say add me to your list and you'll okay. get our regular okay. email updates about the virtual bible study all right just final note from kevin in the chat room on this marriage separation and divorce question he says we are not focused on being trustworthy and and covenant keepers our society allows for a weak view of keeping contracts but god's word sees covenant breakers as sinners i think that's a really good observation good deal okay so I had to do like you, Jacob. I had to look this up. Are you familiar with a ministry called Celebrate Recovery? Well, that first question is easy to answer. (laughs) The answer was no, no, I didn't. But now I know a little bit. I don't know a lot, but I know a little bit. Uh, Celebrate Recovery is is one of those 12-step programs. The the, the most famous 12-step program is Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> and this is this is apparently modeled after that in some degree toward other addictions. Mm-hmm. It's it's about drug addiction and 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 so forth. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not sure whether they would do, deal with the, uh, psychological addictions like pornography mm-hmm. or something else, but certainly drug addictions. Uh, it's a 12-step program. It originated with with the Saddleback Church out in California, and some people will recognize that Saddleback Community Church. The the head guy out there, Rick Warren, mm-hmm. uh, is pretty well-known author. Uh, his book, Purpose Driven Church, was a mega bestseller, and a lot of people read that. Um, but this this group organized among members of that Saddleback movement out in the West Coast. It, But it is fully and completely a human organization. It's, it's run by a director and a board of of directors, uh, it is not a church. It's 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 uh, it's actually just a human institution that has been established for the purpose of helping people deal with addictions. Now, Timothy says there's a Celebrate Recovery program at a local Baptist church that has helped several in my community that are faithful Christians. So Timothy has some exposure to it and says it has been helpful. Okay, now let's make this distinction. Are they doing a good thing to help people with addictions? I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't argue that point at all. I, and people who have serious addiction problems need help for sure, and we we understand that. The question is, though, can a congregation participate in such a program? In other words, what if we here at college you said we really like that celebrate recovery thing? Uh, we're going to open our doors and let these people come in here and do their work, or we're going to take from our treasury some money and send to them to help promote their business and the work that they're doing because we think it's it's a good thing. I think that's the question being asked when our question says, what are your thoughts about a congregation participating in such a program? I don't think the church has authority to support any human organization. Uh, uh, could could uh, could the church send money to the American Red Cross? No, I think the American Red Cross probably does a lot of really good work, but the church is is not authorized to support human institutions of any kind. That would include Christian schools and universities, uh, homes for unwed mothers. Uh, uh, of course, fifty seventy five years ago, a, a big controversy about supporting orphans. I don't. Is it good to take care of needy orphans? Sure. But the church is not authorized to support human institutions that are engaged in that work. And so 
My yeah. answer to that part of the question would be, no, a congregation can't participate in that way. The church has well-defined uh, work to be done and needs to stick to that work, in yeah. other words, what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, the, we talk about evangelism, edification, and benevolence as being the three broad areas of work that God has authorized the church to be in, and and we got to be careful to keep the church in that business and not not go beyond what we're authorized to be doing. So one concern is uh, maybe some of the teachings that uh, they espouse. Kent is in Calhoun, Georgia, and says the Celebrate Recovery Ministry is a component of the emergency, emerging church movement. This movement is a view where those who advocate such desire freedom to explore new views and thoughts that are not based upon absolute truth. This movement has been established upon some of the principles of postmodernism, they affirm, falsely affirm that much of what one espouses is shaped by culture and controlled by emotions, aesthetics, and heritage, uh, while they do uh, make attempts to reform individuals who have some serious moral problems within their lives, they do so without viewing their approach as being based upon absolute truth. This is where the Celebrate Recovery Ministry is highly inconsistent. They do not uh, base their programs upon an outright denial of bi biblical morality. However, they are highly subjective in their approach and do not respect the concept of absolute truth, John 8, 32. It is wrong to identify and worship with the local church that is involved in this program. Such local churches who advocate the system do not respect the pattern, principle, nor authority of the New Testament. Yeah, and that's the last part of that question. Would it be wrong to worship with a congregation that's involved? And I, th I take it that the questioner is asking, could I be a member or work with a congregation that's involved in a program like this or others? There's this ton of others. There's just all kinds of other such programs out there. And I think it's not authorized. And, you know, just it, it boils down ultimately to the question of Bible authority. Do we have authority for that sort of thing? Uh, one of the problems is that people are just so prone to use the end justifies the means kind of reasoning when it comes to this. These people are doing a lot of good, they argue. We're not, we're not inclined to, to disagree with that argument. That's not the point. Is the, the question is, is the church authorized to be involved in that action? In other words, is it a good work to help people overcome addictions? Well, sure it is. But... To, to, the church is not authorized to support a man-made organization, a human organization, to accomplish that work. And so, it's, it, again, it's not a question of whether they're doing good or not. It's a question of what is the church authorized to do. And if the church is engaged in unauthorized activities, then we should not, we, we can't participate in that. Mohan says, uh, yes, I've heard of This is Mohan from... Uh, China, uh, not China, Chicago. Chicago, we're about the same. Chicago, <laughs> Mohan. No. Uh, yes, I've heard of the program. It helps people deal with addictions. Uh, I would be hesitant to use that program since I believe it was developed by denominational thinking. However, since part of the church's job is to edify the saints, providing biblical counseling to those in the church would be a good idea. I believe the church providing addiction treatment for those outside is not authorized in scriptures. The church is authorized first to evangelize the lost. So could the church help Christians who are struggling with addiction? They should. So let's say that we have a member here who, and and I'm, uh, I'm sad to say we have had past experience. We had a man, when I first moved here over 20 years ago, there was a fellow here who, who was an alcoholic. He struggled with it mightily. Uh, and we really engaged with him trying to help him deal with that. Uh he had recurring bouts of alcohol, alcoholic activity, but then he would, we would work with him, and he'd come back and repent. I think, I mean, those are really serious, sinful conditions, and definitely the church has a business trying to help people, help its members in particular, deal with addiction, addictive problems. It's not about helping. It's about the how. Yeah. And uh, there's lots of things to be concerned about here with the how when it comes to um, the Celebrate Recovery uh, organization. Okay, we got uh, uh, so in the chat room. The guest fifty six twelve says, "Wouldn't supporting a Christian school be deemed evangelistic?" Uh, not necessarily. Uh, well, it, well, part of it could be deemed evangelistic. It's not, and that's not really the question. Yeah. Again, the question is the how. How do we yeah. accomplish that? Not everything about a Christian school is evangelistic. Exactly. There might be Bible classes at the and Christian school, and it is a human institution. It's, it's right. not. It's not. It's not. A, it's not a church. It's not a part of the church. It's a human institution. To illustrate with absurdity, I'm, I understand. I'm trying to do that. 
So here's a guy who's got a hot dog stand, but he promises to pass out a Bible tract with every hot dog he sells. Can the church partner with him in the hot dog business? Well, no, obviously not. Well, part of what he's doing is evangelistic. We would, and so again, I intend that to be a, a, a you know, absurd illustration, but sometimes that proves the point. Um, Timothy in the chat room says, what about attending a program that is held at a denominational church? For instance, Dave Ramsey's program for financial success. So his question is, here's the Baptist church, mm-hmm. and we have them in our area. Uh, have, have several different denominations in our area that will host a I think our listeners, probably most of our listeners have heard of Dave Ramsey. He's a financial guy on the radio in Nashville. Uh, But I think he's syndicated all over the country. Could I go to the Baptist church to attend their Dave Ramsey session? Uh, Personally, I would not. uh, Because, again, I think it would be condoning an activity on a part of that religious organization that I don't think religious organizations ought to be involved in. I wouldn't. We would never have a Dave Ramsey event here. Uh, because we object to it scripturally, what about, I mean, so would I be endorsing them to do what I would not do here? I I think there's some real inconsistency there, Monty. I think there's a great teaching opportunity when we maybe are presented with an opportunity to go to whatever denominational church is having something like that. We're invited to go to that. And we say, no, I don't believe it's right for the church to do things like that, and I won't do anything at your congregational building, whatever, that I wouldn't do where my normal worship is. And then they want to ask why. So we have an opportunity there to teach about authority. When our children were young, we were homeschooling. There was a homeschool organization event going to be taking place at some church, and I don't remember which one it was, but it doesn't matter. But that was our answer to them. No, we don't believe that's right to do that in the church, and we're not going to do something at yours that we wouldn't do where we worship. So, and, it, and it was an opportunity to teach them a little bit about authority. I don't think it made any difference in their lives, but they stopped and thought about it a minute and thanked us for standing up for what we believed in. So, it, again, it's not about whether or not the thing is a good activity. Mm-hmm. Home, homeschool activities are good. Helping people with their money is a good thing to do. It's about what work has God given the church to be engaged in, and let's stay focused on doing what he told us to do. And then as individuals, if we want to do these other things, then fine. But what the, what, what's the church's task? What was it, has it been given to do by God? What's its God-given mission? And take care of that. Do that. Focus on that. And make that, uh, make that our sole objective. Exactly right. All right. Let's, let's grab our, our last break. we got... Two more questions. We're going to have to hurry to get to the top of the hour. All right. Uh, when we get back, the next question. Ooh. Gender identity issues. Ooh, I don't know if we've talked about this before. We're going to talk about that on the other side. Don't go anywhere. We're back right after this. These guys are doing all of the talking. We need to hear from you. Call in now. The virtual Bible study continues right after this. Misconception number 22. The folks at the College of Church of Christ don't like music. Some people say this, but it's simply not true. The fact is we love music and use it as often as we can in worship. Granted, we don't have pianos, organs, guitars, or drums, and we can explain that if you would like. But we do have music, good music. You ought to come and be a part of it sometime. You may have been misled about us. Why not come and learn the truth about the College of Church of Christ this Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m.? Remember, the truth will set you free. We're tracking the trends on the virtual Bible study. Trust in the Bible's reliability is dropping. American adults were asked if they agreed or disagreed with this statement. The Bible is totally accurate in all of the principles it teaches. 25 years ago, 46% strongly agreed, but today only one-third of Americans say so. And the percentage of those who strongly disagree has nearly doubled. That information is via Barna Research. The Word of God says in 1 Peter 1, beginning verse 24, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Missed a recent virtual Bible study program? Listen to any of our past programs from the archive section of our website. Now, back to the virtual Bible study. Hey, we're back on the program. Before we leave this idea of addiction and, uh, and counseling, a listener asked, uh, see if you can mention or do a future program on whether it's right for Christians to go to professional counseling for mental health issues such as repeated sinful o- OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder thoughts struggles. So would it be right? Somebody's having uh, some, maybe some psychological issues, maybe some repeated sinful thoughts that they can't uh, overcome. 
uh, professional counseling? Is that an option for so, a so, in other words, beyond just, just seeking help from a, a brother or sister who might... Yeah. Could just, I go to a professional? Could you go to a professional? I think yes, but I think you've got to be really careful because a vast, huge, overwhelming majority of counselors, even those who, uh, you know, might be pseudo-religious in their... In their account, are not going to give sound biblical counseling. So you got to be really, really careful. But I think, you know, I, I couldn't see any biblical principle that'd be violated by doing that. In fact, uh, wise men seek counsel. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that would certainly be justified and yeah. authorized in the scriptures, as provided it is the right counsel. Uh, so you'd have to do your homework there. So appreciate that thought. All right. Um, okay. Um, Let's now, see. And now Lou, Lou in Minnesota uh, says TVBS. The virtual Bible study talked about whether or not churches should sponsor certain activities outside of church and what a what is biblical on July 11, 2019. So Lou is saying, you know, go back in our archives if you want to learn more about that. So thanks, Lou. I'd forgotten about that, but uh, Lou references our program on July 11th, and those are in the archives. Uh, look that up. It's easiest to look uh, on the tab for. WMA, which is Windows Media Audio, WMA Archives, uh, and you can find those real easily. Oh, thanks, Lou, for that. All right, number three of our questions tonight, gender identity. I think this one is pretty straightforward. Gen concerning gender identity issues, if a woman desires to be called a man, should Christians abide by that so as not to offend? Um, Kent just nails this, I think. Let me read it. In the divine revelation of God set forth in the scriptures, we read of only two genders, male and female. All individuals are procreated as being either male or female. Such is, e such is an either-or situation that cannot be changed. Just because an individual is not satisfied in the way that they were procreated does not change the fact of the situation and thus does not change reality. While I do, de do not desire to purposely offend others, if truth is offensive to some, then so be it. I would much rather that truth offend sinners than I offend God. Yeah, so Jesus didn't soft pedal or change his message just because it might offend someone. Uh, we want to do speak the truth in love, obviously, but uh, but the truth needs to be taught, and the truth is that God does not endorse such behaviors. In fact, Romans chapter one talks about this: this idea that the idea of homosexuality and gender identity issues that really is an affront to God, and, and, um, and look at verse uh, 20, for, uh, verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of, God, of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man. God gave them over then to uncleanness. Yeah, these and, things that are and, not but, so it is an affront to God, that God made me a male, but I'm I, I'm not going to listen to what how God told me to live my life as a male. I'm going to live as a female. Now, note, notice in that same context, at verse 26, God gave them up to their vile affections. For even the their women did change the natural to use to that which is against nature. And likewise, all, the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one to another. Men with men working that which is unseemly. So there is what is natural. What, what is by nature man and woman and the roles of men and women, and they're not changeable. They're not interchangeable. You know, you can't, you know, what, what if I self-identify as a, as a bird? Are you going to have to treat me like a bird so that you don't offend me? I mean, that's, that's just ridiculous, actually. So it is, it is, a, it is a, a challenge to God's sovereignty over our lives when we behave in these, uh, engage in these behaviors. Okay, number four. And the last one for tonight. Uh, how should a Christian relate to parents who are unfaithful to the Lord? Now, that's a little bit different twist on the story, Monty, because we have been asked plenty of times, how should we, what would a parent do if their grown child was not faithful to the Lord? And that's a tough scenario for sure. But this actually changes those roles now it's the child who's faithful, but the parents have become unfaithful. Any thoughts? I, I don't see that that's really any different. Uh, we have 
responsibilities toward our parents. Jesus condemned the Jews because they were not honoring their father and mother. They, they weren't providing the care or, or providing for the necessities that their parents weren't able to provide for for themselves anymore. We have a biblical responsibility to help our parents to honor them, that, and that would include financially, if they needed help financially, or there may be other ways, provide care, whatever that we would need to for our parents. That's our responsibility. Uh, if our parents are unfaithful, and we might not go hang out and socialize with them a lot because they've been withdrawn from or should be withdrawn from, so we're, we're going to have to define some boundaries there and make it clear to them that I'm helping you with this because it's my God-given responsibility and I've got to be pleasing to God, but I do not approve of your activities, uh, just like we might have to do that with a minor child that was living with us still or something like that. So we've got our responsibilities and we, the, given by God that we have to fulfill but we need to make clear boundaries and and proceed in that direction. You know, I you you've made this point to me before, Monty. Uh, in Ephesians six verse two, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. So here's a faithful Christian, but his parents are not being faithful. Well, when he when he continues to do right. And even when he rebukes them and urges their repentance and maybe alters his social interaction with them because of their unfaithful, and, and he is actually honoring them, although they won't recognize it as such. He is honoring them because he is living like they taught him to live when they themselves were faithful Christians. Now, that, so that's one angle in it. But the other angle is we still have to honor them. Yeah. We can't treat them in ways that are dishonorable. Uh, no, we're not talking about disrespecting no, them at all, I, I don't think. I know, I understand, and I agree. Uh, so, But we, we still have obligations to them as our parents, mm -hmm. is my, ob is my uh, observation here. So should a, a, an unfaithful parent become ill and need care, I couldn't turn my head and look the other way. As their, as their child, I would still have the obligation to honor my parents in that. Uh, and so I'd have obligations there. Uh, certainly spiritual obligations, but physical as well. But it, and it would be similar to what we were talking about earlier in the program about a, a wife whose husband was withdrawn from. Right. She still has family responsibilities mm -hmm. to carry out, but it, it's it's a changed relationship. Right. Uh, right. The, the spiritual aspect of their relationship has been changed. So, but the idea of honoring is not dependent on them. Right. Just like First Peter chapter two verse seventeen says, "Honor the king." It's not dependent on whether the king is a Republican or a Democrat or if I like his policies or I don't or if even he's a good guy. I honor the king. But I don't sin in order to honor him. That's right. Exactly. Yep. yep. Money. Well, that's why I was saying we have to make clearly defined boundaries. We're going to probably have to explain to them that, look, I don't agree with your lifestyle, whatever the sin is they're participating in. I don't agree with it. I can't be a part of it. Uh, but I do have a responsibility given to me by God to provide for you in this way, and I'm going to do it, but that doesn't mean I agree with what you're doing. I mean, we, we still have an opportunity to teach them Absolutely. and be clear about yeah. what's going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So we got it uh, on the oh. previous question, and we got a chat uh, comment from Dwight. He's about, do we respect people who want to change their gender identity? He says, no, God made you. I can't go against what God created. I think that's right, Dwight. Hope to see Dwight in just a few hours. Hey, headed to see yeah. Dwight. All yeah. right. Yeah. yeah we're gonna, and we're gonna, Bonnie, you and I hopefully see Dwight too before long. Saturday night. Yeah, Dwight, we're coming your way. Dwight might be getting out of town. <laughs> hey, uh, here's what Kent said about it. He said, if a Christian's parents become unfaithful to the Lord, then the Christian must withdraw from their parents. This does not mean that such would necessarily negate any family obligations as set forth by the Scriptures. First Timothy 5, verse 8 um, if any provide not for his own, especially those in his own house, he's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel there, that passage that, that uh, Kent references. One divine requirement of God does not re negate any other divine requirement. Perhaps when individual family members withdraw from unfaithful parents, such can make a deep impression upon the parents for, they need, for their need of repentance. Yet at the same time, one continues to sustain family obligations and obedience to the Scripture. I think that's so right. It's a it'll be a fine line to walk. Hard. hard really hard. 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 Yeah. Really hard. Okay. All right. Monty, final thoughts from you tonight. 
Well, it just boils down to whatever we're the subject we're discussing. We need to study our Bibles, see what God had to say on the subject, and then follow those instructions. And if we're doing that, it's going to work out for the best for us no matter I, what. I think you're right, and I think it's interesting. The Bible has the answers. I mean, this, these were some challenging questions tonight, but the Scriptures have the answers to all of life's questions. Yeah, absolutely. All right, good discussion. Dad, thanks for your time tonight. Thanks, Jacob. Monty, thanks for being here. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you for joining us on the other end of the line. Hope you've benefited from our study and discussion of God's Word. Hope you make plans to be back here this time next week for another edition of the virtual Bible study. In the meantime, we encourage you to put God first in your life, study His inspired word, the Bible, and live by it every day. You'll never regret it. Thanks for listening to the virtual Bible study brought to you by the College View Church of Christ. The College View Church of Christ meets at 1618 Hampshire Pike in Columbia, Tennessee. If you are in the Columbia, Tennessee area, we encourage you to worship with the College View Church of Christ on Sunday mornings at 930 and on Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock. The College View Church of Christ also welcomes you to attend their Wednesday night Bible studies at 7 o'clock. If you have any questions about something that was said on tonight's broadcast or would like more information about the College College View Church of Christ, please call 931-381-4567. That number again, 931-381-4567. Or for more information on the internet, visit collegeview.com. Be sure to tune into the virtual Bible study this time next Thursday for another informative study of God's Word.